All right, welcome to Quick Show. Last year, 2020, streaming services accounted for a whopping 68% of all in home viewing, basically doubling from the year before. Of course, we had COVID, we were in lockdown, we were hungry for entertainment. The problem is, is that as we've had uh, this move culturally over to technologically over to streaming, we've also had, we've never been in a position where we've had so much access for children to violent sexual content that is brought into our homes. This is something that the uh, uh, the Parents Television and Media Council is a, is a what would you call it, Melissa? You're, are you a watchdog over them or yeah, over the industry? Watchdog okay. is, You're a watchdog. Safe. And so we've brought on Melissa Henson, who is the Director of Communications and Public Education for the Parents Television and Media Council. Melissa, can you tell us what you do in your position and what your organization does? Sure. Uh, well, the Parents Television and Media Council, we, we recently changed our name from the Parents Television Council to reflect um, sort of a broadening of our, our mission. When we started out, there were four broadcast channels, five broadcast channels, a handful of cable channels that were offering original content. And of course, the television universe has changed substantially in the last 20 years. Um, as, as you cited it at, at the beginning here, 68% um, of uh, uh, video content was being streamed uh, this past year. And the pandemic, I think, just accelerated this rate of change. More and more people cutting the cord, more and more people switching to streaming services. So the marketplace has really changed. Um, so what we try to do is um, help to provide research to educate families about media harms, media contents, so that they can make the best and most informed decisions about media for their own families. Um, we also do some advocacy work. Uh, we've been uh, pushing, for example, for um, um, a better uh, uniformity in the television rating system, a better enforcement of broadcast decency laws and so forth. Um, my role with Parents Television Media Council, I'm the um, director of programs. So I oversee our research, I oversee our publications and our ad advocacy work. Okay, and that's what we're going to get to. There's a recent report that you put out that I believe you put together on uh, the streaming companies. Now, looking back, I, I, I remember when I was a kid, Melissa, I, we, it was just the time where cable was starting to come out. And I remember, you know, I, I was the kid that grew up with the, with the, with the rabbit ears, right? The antenna. Yeah. And, and I had access to about seven channels, maybe more if I could tune something in on UHF. You get something else, but, but that's what I, you know, that was, that was what I had. And there were restrictions on that, right? There were guidelines or regulations from the FCC that said, Hey, you know, this is, this is what is allowed of, over the airwaves. And this is what is not allowed. I remember going to a friend's house, a good, my best friend, he had cable right early on and, and wow, the programming was completely different, right? It was opened up quite a bit. We've now gone or, or are going through another metamorphosis, if you will, moving from the cord, as people call it now, moving from cable into streaming. What as we've as we've evolved here and in, in, into, into, into streaming, as we're moving more and more into this, what are the primary issues for families that are concerned about the content that's coming into their homes? Well, I think probably the biggest issue for families is that um, the streaming services are, are unregulated. Uh, broadcast decency laws do not apply to streaming services um, because they're not using the broadcast airwaves. Um, and even, even though uh, federal broadcast and decency laws don't apply on traditional cable, wired cable, because they're using privately owned cable lines to get the content into your home, uh, content was still held in check mostly by advertisers. Um, but what we're seeing on these streaming services is that there's no federal broadcast decency law that's applicable. And in many cases, there isn't even advertisers to constrain the content. And so what we're seeing is that there is very adult content on these streaming services, a substantial amount of mature rated content, 
um, significantly more sex, violence, profanity uh, than, than families are probably used to seeing even on cable television. So here, here's a question. This, is, this comes from complete ignorance on my end. When, you're, when I'm pulling up something on Netflix or Hulu or Disney, whatever it might be, and I see a TV 14 or a TV MA, who regulates that then if it's not the FCC? Who, 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 who is putting in place that, that rating on that, on that show? So it, it's the same with the streaming services um, as it is with the broadcast network. So there is, for the TV industry, no equivalent of the Motion Picture Association of America. So there is no independent ratings board or ratings body. Um, um, the MPAA with motion pictures, they, there's a sort of an anonymous board of people that review these films and supposedly applying um, a set of objective criteria, they're, they're giving the ratings to the movies. Um, there is no TV industry equivalent. It's basically each network deciding for themselves what the program should be rated. And in the case of streaming services, it's the same thing. They are rating their own programs. Um, the problem that we're seeing is that there's very little consistency in how those ratings are applied across streaming platforms and even sometimes within ratings platforms. So you have one standard for broadcast and cable television and often a very different standard when it comes to these streaming services. And sometimes they use a different combination of letters than you're used to seeing. So on broadcast TV or cable, you're used to seeing G or TV Y7, you're used to seeing PG, PG-13 and so on, um, or TV-14 rather. On the streaming services, you may see AC for adult content, or you may see um, SL for suggestive language. So, so many of them are coming up with their own, uh, their own content descriptors, their own ratings. Some are only using age-based ratings. Some are using a combination of age-based ratings, content descriptors. So it's sort of all over the map. So, so there's, no, there's no real way to know what's coming up. I mean, I, I, can, I can see a rating, but I have no idea what's going to be coming through that, that, that show. Right. But although, you know, in fairness, I will say, <laughs> I'll give them a little bit of credit for this, which is um, we have found in general um, that the ratings are probably a little bit more strictly applied um, on some of these streaming channels than, uh, than we've seen in the past on broadcast and cable. So they don't have any qualms about using the TVMA rating, for example, because they're not worried about scaring off advertisers with that MA rating. So they use that MA rating pretty freely and pretty liberally. Uh, so, but if you see that MA rating, you can pretty much guarantee that this is adult content and you don't want the kids in the room. So let's talk about access a little bit here. Uh, the president of your organization, Tim Winter, said the following. He said, for parents who are working tirelessly to prepare, protect their children from graphic programming, the challenge has never been greater. It is no longer a matter of knowing what is on a handful of broadcast or cable networks during a given time of day. Yeah. Launching any one of a dozen streaming apps gives a child instantaneous access to a virtually unlimited catalog of programming. It is not feasible or realistic to expect a parent to be familiar with all the available titles on any one streaming service, let alone the content on each of those titles. Now, of yeah. course, when you couple that with phones, Mm -hmm. and the mobility and mobile devices, this, this, is a, this is a Pandora's box here to me. I mean, how, how, how can you possibly keep up with all this? Next month, there might be another streaming service or another app that allows you to have certain entertainment. How do you keep up with this? It, 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 is, it is so challenging. It is so hard. Um, and especially, as you point out, when you, when you add um, mobile phones to the mix, um, and because a lot of, you know, when I was in school, my mom would send me to school with a quarter in case I had to make an emergency phone call. <laughs> you don't have I remember those days schools anymore, right? Yeah. So um, parents are giving their kids mobile phones so that they can um, be contacted in case of an emergency. Um, but having those mobile phones means, for one thing, kids have greater access to content than they've ever had before. M much of that content is being viewed outside of the purview of their parents. Um, it, it's, it's ex extremely difficult to monitor what your kids are watching on their mobile devices. And, and a lot of times, um, 
the mobile companies, mobile providers will provide incentives. So for example, if you renew your contract with Verizon, you get a free year of Disney Plus or renew your contract with AT&T and get a free year of Netflix. So these um, streaming services are often being bundled in with mobile plans to incentivize people to um, re-up their contracts, get you know an unlimited data plan. Um, and so um, when you bundle these things together, it's extremely difficult for parents to stay on top of it all. So, so here's a question. Maybe this is beyond the scope of what you guys do. I don't know. But how do we know how much this is affecting kids? Do we know, is this, you know, obviously, I mean, just from common sense, as part of the title of your report that we're going to get to here, uh, you know, as parents, we can say, well, we don't want certain, uh, certain content getting to them, but do we know how much this screen time is affecting the kids and, and, and the content apart from just saying more of it is getting to them? Do we know that? Do we know the results of that? Well, this is, this is, um, all relatively new in human history. Um, and there isn't a great deal of, of academic research that I'm aware of that, that's looking specifically at the phenomena of streaming video. We do know, however, that kids have spent more time online in the past year than ever before. Um, because in addition to having outside of the home activities curtailed because of the pandemic, you know, you can't go to soccer practice or swim meet or um, go to the movies or go to the mall. Uh, so they're, they're staying home. And what they're doing at home is mostly playing games, streaming video, they're, they're engaging on social media. So they're spending a tremendous amount of time online. We can extrapolate from past research on how kids are affected by TV content. So for example, we know that kids who are exposed to higher levels of violence in the media are more likely to behave violently. Uh, and we know that those terms are not only, uh, or those, uh, those effects are not only immediate in the short term, but also last long lasting. So longitudinal studies have found that people who were exposed to high levels of violent content as children were more aggressive even as adults. Um, we know that kids who are exposed to high levels of sex in the media are likely to initiate sex at a younger age. They're going to be more sexually active. They're going to have more sexual partners over the course of their lifetime. Uh, they're likely to expect higher, higher levels of sexual activity among their peers than, than kids with less exposure. So I think we can assume the same holds true for kids who are exposed to streaming media content. And as I said before, um, you know, some of the streaming media content these kids are being exposed to is far worse than, you know, uh, the, the content that these studies uh, were based on, um, you know, uh, would have been much tamer compared with what kids are seeing on streaming media today. So you're saying it matters. Yeah, absolutely. It matters. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, 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 you guys had made the comment, uh, the organization that, it, you know, a lot of parents are very concerned about the diet of their kids. You know, what you buy at the grocery store, what you're going to give them, but are we as vigilant about their entertainment diet, right? What, what they're consuming. And, you know, that's, that's a, that's a very good point, I think. Right. I mean, yeah, obviously absolutely. the decisions that are going to make more down the road, the type of person they're becoming, the standards that they're creating, that's a lot more important than whether you're eating carrots and peas as compared to Twinkies, I would say. Yeah. Well, moreover, what we have also seen is uh, sort of a, a fatigue on the part of parents in enforcing media rules during this pandemic. So we, we saw a couple of pieces that came out in the past year. There was an opinion piece in the New York Times where a woman was saying, yeah, I've, I've loosened my household rules on media. I'm letting my teenagers watch MA content. Uh, but I, but it's fine because I'm watching with them. Well, no, it's not fine. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, what the research shows is that a parent can mitigate some of the harmful effects, but mitigation is not elimination, right? You're lessening the severity. You're not eliminating it entirely. Um, so, um, so, you know, it, parents are running out of G or PG content. So they're letting their kids watch more mature content or um, they're just fed up having to make decisions and they're just giving their kids free reign. Um, we even saw Bridgerton, which is a TVMA rated series uh, being recommended as a, as a, a team viewing option um, in uh, one Washington Post story. So, um, so I think this is another um, troubling trend that we need to be aware of and concerned about. 
Yeah, I would say it's 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 pretty much common sense to think that, you know, many teens and younger are getting a very high dose of TVMA content. Yeah. From from streaming services. No question. Now your your report here, a parent's guide to streaming media. This was put out just last month. Uh, it looks to me like you had a focus here of of primarily looking at the parental controls on each of the major streaming services, and then also the economics of moving from cutting the cord to, to streaming. What, tell me how the report was conducted and, and what were the goals of the report? Yeah, well, what we wanted this to be sort of like a, a consumer reports uh, document uh, for families that are weighing the options that are considering various streaming services what are the risks? What are the benefits? Um, what are the advantages or disadvantages of going with uh, the various streaming services that are out there? Um, we chose to focus on some of the more popular um, streaming services. So at this point, we have probably over 100 competitors in there. And in the appendix of our study, uh, we list uh, some of the ones that you can get as channels added to your Amazon Prime account. And some of these are very um, narrow focused, very targeted, uh, like they have Broadway for people that are into Broadway shows, or they have, um, they have one that's just about martial arts, or they have one that's uh, just cartoons for preschool age children. So you can get very granular and very specific with the content on these streaming services. Um, but we decided to focus on the sort of the high level ones, the ones with the highest subscriber um, and those would be Netflix, Disney Plus, Apple TV Plus, HBO Max, Peacock, Prime Video, uh, Paramount Plus, CBS. Uh, I'm sorry, Paramount, CBS All Access became Paramount Plus, um, and Hulu. So these are the, some of the most popular streaming services that are out there, and they're also probably the most um, broadly targeted. So they're trying to capture the largest possible audience. They're not uh, narrow. Uh, special interest like uh, Broadway HD that I mentioned. Okay. And what were the findings on the parental controls on these, on these streaming services? Were they favorable? Were they not favorable? Um, largely uh, unfavorable, I would say. Um, what we are seeing is um, more consistency in how the parental controls operate uh, than the last time we looked at, at streaming services back in 2017. So they all seem to be moving in one direction, which is a combination of pin restricted access used in combination with age-based ratings. So you set your upper limit of, you know, I don't want my child to be able to access anything that's rated above PG. Um, and it, for you as an adult, if you want to watch something that's above PG, you have to enter a pin code in order to access it. And this seems to be the most common arrangement um, for the parental controls. Um, in some instances, uh, like with Hulu, which is owned by Disney, uh, you don't have that level of granularity. All you can do is you have an adult profile and you have a kid's profile. The problem with Hulu is that they don't differentiate between, um, say, a seven-year-old child and a 13-year-old child. So they've got the PG-13 and TV-14 rated stuff lumped in there with the PG and the G rated stuff. And, and frankly, there's a lot of pretty wretched content. Uh, that's rated PG-13 or TV-14. Um, and so the way it's set up means that those young kids, six, seven, eight years old, have access to the, the, the um, more mature content that's rated PG-13 and TV-14. The other big problem with Hulu is that there is no um, barrier to stop a child from switching accounts. So if they're viewing content on the kids, uh, the kids set up, they can switch over to the adult profile without any problem at all and access all the content that's on the adult profile um, which means it doesn't even matter to have profiles because it doesn't even matter do right right <laughs> okay what so so they're not really trying very hard no i mean <laughs> they're all. they're looking at their subscription base and 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 the monetary effects of this but what why isn't the FCC involved in this? I mean, I'm trying to figure this out. So again, I go back to my, my childhood. Everything on the airwaves is FCC regulated. It moves to cable. It's not. It's like, wow, this is a whole new world here for a kid. Um, and, and now it's going well beyond that. 
right? I mean, it, it's kind of like saying, okay, well, if I'm uh, since someone is paying specifically for this service, they should be able to get whatever they want. That'd be a very libertarian approach to it. And it's like, okay, you know, you're an adult, you're buying this, great. But it, the argument against that, obviously, is again what you said. I think is the is the parental fatigue. I don't think there's any way that parents are going to be able to keep up with this. I, I don't see how you're going to be able to. I think that society with the broadcast TV said, we're going to protect the innocence of kids. And then it was done when cable came around. Is, is the FCC ever going to get involved with this? It would require um, new law. It would require either uh, revising like the Family Movie Act or introducing new legislation to extend the FCC's authority into this area. Because, I mean, when you think about it, it's coming over, it, coming into your home across the Internet, which is the same way people are accessing pornography right now, um, which is not regulated either for the most part. Um, so there's, there's, there's very little precedent for the FCC to get involved in this sphere. Does, is our, our Netflix then, since it's streaming our Netflix, you're not really going on, you're, you're getting it through Wi-Fi at home, but, but our Netflix and Hulu and Amazon prime, are they all protected by section 230? Uh, it, it, that's, that's getting a little bit, um, beyond my, my level okay. of expertise. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that would be an interesting, that would be interesting to see that because it's, yeah. you know, the porn sites and the social media companies, they're all protected by section 230 from, from civil litigation. Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway. Okay. So is there, yeah, any I, I will say though, um, there is not very good precedent, even in, um, you know, broadcast television, um, uh, cable television movies, for holding uh, content creators accountable for any kind of impulses that they might inspire. So you may remember the uh, court case involved um, uh, movie Natural Born Killers, mm -hmm. uh, where some copycat criminals uh, said they yep. were inspired by that movie and, and the courts rejected that. Um, so no, no movie has ever been held accountable for inspiring violent acts. So I, I don't see any civil liability uh, for these streaming companies for the content that they're producing and distributing. Okay. So what about in Congress? Is there any movement there at all? Any initiatives that are being pushed forward for FCC getting involved with streaming media? Um, we haven't seen any movement on that front. Um, what we, uh, what we are hoping to see is uh, you may, may have heard or be familiar with a company called VidAngel, which uh, provided a layer of, of protection for families, content filtering. So, um, you have your Netflix subscription and then you add VidAngel on top of that existing Netflix subscription. So Netflix is getting their money, uh, but the VidAngel filtering allows uh, an added layer of protection. So what they do is they, they allow you to skip over content you don't want your kids to see. If you are sensitive to violence, you can skip over the violent content. If you're sens sensitive to foul language, you can skip over that. Um, but uh, Disney tried to sue and put them out of business. So we have seen um, some movement toward uh, updating laws that allowed for content filtering, uh, but haven't been updated, haven't been looked at since the advent of streaming video. So we're looking forward to Congress maybe moving forward on updating those laws to allow parents to filter content. Now, your report also had a ranking of the different services and how well they protected uh, uh, families through this type of filtering and, and parental controls. You have Netflix here at the top. Why do you have Netflix? I mean, that's good to know because I think that aren't they the most popular? They, they are. Uh, okay. Although I think they, they missed their subscriber targets uh, for the first quarter of this year. Um, Netflix has some hugely problematic content. Um, so we're not saying Netflix is a, is a good actor or good, good, you know, a uh, good company in terms of corporate responsibility. Mm -hmm. But right now they have something that most of their competitors don't have. And that's the ability to block individual titles. So in addition to being able to say, I don't want my child to watch anything that's rated PG 13 and above, you can also say, Oh, but here's this PG rated show that I have a problem with. Um, and you can block that program as well. Uh, or if you set your parental controls to TVMA and above, you can say, I want to block these specific individual titles uh, from my child. 
Um, so that's an added layer of protection that we hope the other streaming companies will will copy. Now you've got Hulu here is the worst. Absolutely the worst. Why were they the Why are they the worst? Yeah. So as I was mentioning before, um, the problem with Hulu is um, that they basically have an adult profile and a kid's profile. Um, and you can move freely between the two. You don't have to enter a pin code. You don't have to uh, overcome any kind of barriers or obstacles if you're in a child viewing profile to switch over to an adult profile. Not only that, they don't allow you to, to um, select your rating threshold. So a seven or eight year old child who's watching Hulu can, can access stuff that's intended for teens. Um, and there are no, no uh, parental controls that allow you to, to get more granular with the ratings. Yeah. So again, you got to ask yourself how, how kid friendly is Disney? Right. 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 They're, they're the primary owner. Isn't that right? Of Hulu. That's right. That's yeah. right. I, all right. Okay. So you have some best practices that you're trying to set up here, a guideline of best practices. Let me go over each one of these things and have you respond to each of these you're looking for reliable gating blocking technology me measures. That goes beyond, as you said here, just a, a separate profile. Right, right. So um, yeah, the, the ability to not only um, block individual titles, which Netflix has done, it would also be worthwhile for these streaming services to add the ability to block entire categories of content or entire genres of content. Um, you know, speaking for myself, for example, I hate horror films. I will never <laughs> voluntarily watch a horror You're film. You're my wife. Yeah. I, I don't even like to see the, you know, the posters uh, mm -hmm. on Netflix, you know, so I, 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 I would like to just eliminate that category. I don't want to have to deal with it. And parents should have that level of, of flexibility and control of, over the content coming into their home. That one seems like a tough one. I, I think that they're, they're wanting to show you everything so that to entice you. <laughs> That's that one seems like tough. Okay, here's the next one: consistent application of age-based ratings. Well, right. so consistent applications. That seems to me like you have to have either a self-regulating, a self-regulating organization, or you have to have the FCC involved with that. Otherwise, how is it going to be consistent? Well, um, there should be an agreed-upon standard of you know what what does PG thirteen mean? So, for example, we did a study about a year ago looking at uh, Netflix uh, content that Netflix is targeted to teenage viewers, um, and you will hear more f words on a TV TV fourteen rated Netflix series than you would see in a PG thirteen rated film in the theaters. Um, so, with the MPAA, their their upper limit is two f words before they bump that rating up to an R. Mm -hmm. um, th there is no such standard on on the streaming services, so you may hear multiple f words on a TV thirteen or a TV fourteen rated series on Netflix. So there needs to be an agreed upon standard. Okay, that's it. Well, well, and again, the way media is being conflated here, it's you know people are streaming their movies now at home as well, even new releases, and it, it would be nice to have something consistent all the way around. Right. Uh, theaters are kind of going by the wayside right now, it seems, although my wife and I still like to go when we can. But all right. So then you've got in here, you're asking for Congress to update the Family Movie Act of 2005 to include streaming media platforms. What does the Family Movie Act of 2005 do to protect yeah. families? So um, the Family Movie Act um, was created on the heels of uh, DVD players uh, that were um, out on the market that enabled you, like if you're watching Titanic, for example, and you want to skip past the nudity in Titanic, these DVD players would allow you to do that. And the studios tried to put them out of business. The Family Movie Act was created to say, no, once you purchase the movie, you have control over it and you should be able to skip past content you don't want coming into your home. So that same principle should apply with these streaming services. You should be able to skip past content you don't want coming into your home. But unfortunately, it doesn't cover the streaming services and the studios have tried to shut down efforts at, at uh, content filtering. And again, is there any initiative in Congress to try and get that done? Yes, I believe um, there, are, there are plans to introduce an update to the Family Movie Act, but uh, we'll keep you posted on how that progresses. Okay. Last one here. You've got the Federal Communications Commission must revisit and renew the promises Congress made to parents when it passed the Child Safe Viewing Act. Yeah. What does the Child Safe Viewing Act say? 
Yeah, so the, the Child Safe Viewing Act, again, was um, it was supposed to be a common sense measures to protect children from harmful media content. Um, and so, um, again, that when that bill passed, when it uh, when it was originally written, streaming video didn't exist. And so uh, the, the protections that are in place in the Child Safe Viewing Act have not been um, have not been applied to these streaming video services. So what we really need to see is anything that is having to do with um, appropriate content restrictions, especially dealing with children, need to be updated to reflect the current media environment. Any reason why that hasn't been done? Uh, well, um, the, the entertainment is, industry has very powerful lobbyists and billions of dollars to spend on lobbying. And I'm sure that's 99% of the reason why it hasn't been done. Yeah. And I just think that, I don't know, I mean, society, I, you got to take care of innocence. You know, you got to take care of the kids and that needs to be an urgent matter for people always. So what are the primary solutions to all of this? What, I mean, we've kind of gone over the, some of these I'd say, but what, what, what is the top thing you would say you would like to see happen in the industry to help protect families? Yeah, so what we are asking for, what we're calling for is a town hall. And we have invited um, the principal players um, in the streaming video industry, um, the, the companies that are mentioned in this report, we've invited them all to participate in a virtual town hall so that we can come together and discuss appropriate measures, appropriate parental controls, um, some, some degree of standardization, uniformity across streaming platforms when it comes to protecting kids from content. Are they going to attend? We don't know. Uh, we, <laughs> we've given them a few weeks to respond. So uh, I, I hope so. I, I'm not optimistic uh, because mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure um, most of these companies are all that motivated to, to protect kids. Yeah. That's a shame. It really is. You know, I think that's a, a barometer of, of where a, a civilization stands when it's uh, looking at how, how hard it fights to, to protect the innocence of those kids. So. Well, Melissa, thanks so much for coming on. We appreciate the information that you've given us. I was very unaware of all of these things here, so I'm glad to know that. I, and I hope that parents that are listening or watching are, are given a little bit more ammunition here to uh, watch their the diet of uh, the, the entertainment diet of, of their kids. And because it's probably not, I mean, I know you guys are efforting here, but I don't know how much better it's going to get. So anyway. Really appreciate it. We'll, make, we'll be sure to put the links for these things uh, and to your organization in the description as well. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you.